Now, almost all vehicles for a long time have variable valve time. This is an 07 Matrix. As you can see, it has variable valve timing. I, Toyota's variable valve timing. There's various systems out there. <clears throat> they all require a clean source of oil to work. They have tiny little holes. They have actuators that can clog up. So what happens is you got to either spend a fortune replacing it, or they do make kits that you can buy that can bypass it, that just jam them in place so that they're like my old Celica. They're not adjustable valve time and they'll run perfectly fine if you don't want to spend a fortune rebuilding the whole engine, replacing those adjustable parts. But what you want is, one, of course, buy a good one like a Toyota that doesn't have a tendency to break anyways, but maintain it by changing the oil. In my own experience, I have seen scores of customers who had a code for the variable valve timing. And I fixed that code by changing their dirty or low oil, putting the new oil, resetting the code, and it didn't come back because the dirty oil made it not work right. But the dirty oil will often ruin them over time. This says use 5W30. That's what you want to use. And of course, in VVT engines, you're better using synthetic oil. The synthetic oil flows better especially under cold temperatures. Realize, 90-something percent of your engine wear is on startup. You have dirty oil or oil that's the wrong viscosity and it doesn't make it to the top where the variable valve timing system is, it will wear on bare metal for a while until the oil makes it up there. And when it wears out and it's gonna cost you thousands of dollars, you're gonna wish you changed your engine oil more frequently. It's a simple thing to do. Now take my Matrix for example. It's 15 years old. I've gone over 5,000 miles since the oil was changed last and when we check it, stick in the dipstick and pull it out on the level surface, it hasn't burned a drop of oil. It's still right on the dot where it was when I changed it over 5,000 miles ago because I take care of it. And I also take care of my hands. So I use these gloves. Hey. They work great. And I have to be a Castrol man, you notice it's 5W30 like it says. I've just been using Castrol my whole life. I like the stuff. Hey, I don't have engine problems. I'm sticking to what I know. Nobody's paying me to say this. There's plenty of good oils out there. I just know I've used the Castrol all these years, never had any problems with it, so I just buy the stuff, buy the case on Amazon, have it shipped to my garage, when I start running out, I buy some more. Just jack the car up. Don't want to get squashed, so put. A jack stand under there too. Then get a nice big drain pan. Put it on a drain plug. And you don't need to be Superman. If you get a long extension bar like this and a 14 millimeter socket, anyone can get this off. It can be on there real tight, but when you got this long extension, even a weekly, you can pull it off. It's nothing. See how easy it is. And out comes the dirty oil. Then if you want to be prepared like me, get yourself a whole package of oil drain plug gaskets. I'll order them from Amazon, get them ahead of time. That way you'll always have a brand new gasket that won't leak and be tight and fall off or leak. Simple to do, do it ahead of time. Then you won't get ripped off. You go to an auto parts store, they might charge you three, four bucks for one. You get a whole package for that on Amazon. Just realize the old gasket will probably be stuck on here. So you need to scrape it off. If you double gasket it, it might leak. So I scrape the old one off, then we'll stick the new one on. First thing you do is make it finger tight. That's finger tight. Down with your giant extension bar, make it nice and snug. You don't want to strip it, but there, you got it pretty tight. It's not going to come off and it's not going to leak. But of course you need your oil filter removal wrench. I like these flexible ones. They fit right on. You get a ratchet and extension and put it on and twist it off. Now when you twist on it, the whole thing will get loose. Then you can take the wrench off. Let it drip a little so you don't make a big mess. Screw the rest of it off and let it empty. There's the old dirty oil. An oil filter. I like the premium oil filters. This particular one's a Bosch. I've used them for years. There's plenty of good ones out there. But realize the premium ones can filter a long time. This is synthetic material. It lasts longer. Silicone gaskets holds up better. Realize the real cheap filters are only good for 3,000 miles. If you're going to change your oil like I do every five or push it to 10,000 miles, you have to have a premium filter or it will not filter right. The cheap ones stop filtering correctly at about 3,000 miles. Then get your new filter and dip it in a little oil because you want the lip to have oil on it. That way it'll seal and it won't stick when you put it on. Then it simply spins on. And you get it as tight as you can with your bare hands. Now how much oil do you put in? Well you get a funnel, take the screw off the top, 
the oil head, stick the funnel in there. Use the correct oil, this is 530. This takes four and a half quarts, that's the listening. But you never trust anything, so put some in, start it up, let it sit, and then measure it. So we'll put four and a half in first. Take your time, if you spill it too fast, it'll come gurgling all over the place. These jugs, they got a see-through. You can see there's half a quart left now. So start it up, let it sit for a couple minutes, and then check it. Then let it sit four or five minutes. And while we're at it, we'll put the mileage down so we'll remember. I used to write it down, it's 85025, but I joined the modern age, so I'll just take a picture of it with my camera. And then it'll be on my camera and I'll know what the mileage is. I'll put it in my Google Drive, then I won't forget it. And what do we find? We'll pull it out. There's the dipstick, and where is it? It's right on the dot. Same spot it was 5,000 miles later. Now we're starting over with clean oil. And what do you do with the old oil? Well, I put it back in the jug. That's where these pans with the spout work better, so you can pour them back in the jug, the dirty oil. It all goes right back in. No mess, no spill if you got a good funnel. Get it all in there. Then just put the top back on and take it to an auto parts store. They recycle it, or a local recycling center, whatever you got in your area. You want to protect your super expensive variable valve timing assembly by just changing the oil regularly with the correct oil and a filter that will last long enough. Now, I mean, if you're a fanatic, you're gonna change your oil every 3,000 miles, you can use the cheap filters. They're good for 3,000. But you really want a premium one if you're gonna take it longer. I did it at five. You see, I've never lost a drop. The engine works fine. Spend a few bucks more, but just like me, you don't have to get ripped off at the auto parts store where they're gonna charge you 10 to $15 for a premium oil filter. Buy them online like I do on Amazon, you save money. Realize that cars are a lot more complex than they used to be. My 94 Celica has a throttle cable. That opens the throttle. The cable goes, of course, down to the pedal, and when you step on it, it opens the throttle. The motor cars are all computerized. They have an electronic throttle. That's down here. There's an electronic motor. There's no cable. It just uses electric wires and a computer. And when you step on the throttle, it's not physically connected to the engine. It's electronic, it's like a computer mouse. You push it down, variable resistor tells how much it's been pushed down, tells the computer. The computer looks at all kinds of factors and decides how wide to open the throttle with the little electric motor that's inside it. Now, you gotta replace the whole throttle body assembly when they go bad, and it's a typical problem with these Dodges. Now, people have been whining for years, saying they didn't build them right, they should recall them. Well, of course, Chrysler fights that tooth and nail. They don't have to fix stuff for free. Granted, this has got 140-something thousand miles on it now, so it's been driven quite a bit. Things will eventually wear out. This is the first time he's really having a problem with that system. He bought it brand new. It was about $21,000, and he's got a lot of miles on it. It's typical. It burns a little bit of oil, but not bad. It's still the original engine. It's still the original transmission. You can see a lot of the parts are still original. You have a nice body style to them. Even the wheels. Aha! It fooled me. I was going to say even the Ally wheels still look good, but those aren't Ally wheels. Those are hubcaps. They're steel wheels beneath. And truthfully, you're better off with steel wheels, because if you bend them, you can hammer them back. They don't shatter like Ally wheels. They cost a whole bunch of money. They look perfectly fine from the outside, but they're a lot cheaper to replace, and they actually outlast Ally wheels for one main reason. It doesn't rust, but it pits. Especially if you live in an area up north where they put salt on the road. They get so pitted that they won't even seal air anymore, and they'll start leaking, then you gotta buy these expensive alloy wheels. Steel wheels, you can see the inside, superficially rust, but they still hold air because the inside, it doesn't really bother them. The interior is still in decent shape. Cloth seats last the longest. You want to have a car that lasts a long time, get cloth seats. They're comfortable. These are nice padded bucket seats. Leather ones would be all cracked. You can see, here's a little bit of leather, and you can see it's cracked, and that was just an elbow. Now, his main problem is something's going on with the throttle system. If you're driving down the road, the lightning bolt warning comes on, it starts shuddering, and sometimes you can't even go over 30 miles an hour. Sometimes you can shut it off, turn it back on, it goes back to normal. It comes and it goes. And that gives us a really good idea what's wrong. Electrical problems can often come and go. They're computer-run systems. They can work, not work, work, not work. Now let's say 
This had a clogged catalytic converter. A clogged catalytic converter can make the light come on. The exhaust can't breathe out the back. It'd be like if you stuff a potato in your mouth, you couldn't breathe all that well. It'll only go up to a certain speed. That's a clogged catalytic converter. It's gonna do that the whole time. It isn't gonna do it and then go away for weeks and weeks and then come back. It's clogged up and it's either gonna have to be replaced or taken off. It's not gonna fix itself like an electronic problem that can come and go and come and go. So we'll get our scan tool out to look at the raw data. And we got it plugged in here. So we're gonna do intelligent diagnosis here. It knows what it is, 2.4, VIN number. And we'll do a smart scan of everything. We'll start with the body control module. It's got one code. So we'll start there. Reverse lamp control circuit open. So we really don't care. That isn't gonna make the car go slow. <laughs> we don't care about that. What we really care about it's a PCM system. It's got a vacuum leak, it's got a catalytic efficiency leak, and a small vacuum leak. So we got little vacuum leaks. That isn't a problem. We'll start it up because that isn't going to make a car stop going at 30 miles an hour. We're going to have to drive it, see if it acts up. For the usual, we're going to clear the codes. Then we're going to go to the PCM. We're going to read the data stream. Then we're going to record it and take it for a spin. I set it off and it occurs at lower speed, so we'll go a little slower. The electric door locks still work. Give it a little gas. Still not acting up. We'll take it out on a road and see what happens. I mean, for an old vehicle, it still handles pretty good. Track's pretty straight. We hit the brakes. They work perfectly fine, no sounds or anything. The car's actually in decent shape for 148,000 miles. So we're we'll getting to our little drag strip, see if it'll act up there. Most of all, give it a little drag strip test, see how fast it'll go. Here we go. Not outrageous, but it's pulling strongly enough. And it won't act up, of course. Isn't that the truth? It's afraid of me because I'm a mechanic and it won't act up now. Yeah, it just keeps accelerating, accelerating, accelerating again. It's not hesitating at all. Get down Tiny Town Road here. Drive around some more. Isn't it odd? We're hoping this car doesn't run correctly, but it keeps running correctly. It never does act up. My machine will record it, but it's got to act up for me to figure out what's wrong. But if it doesn't act up, and the check engine light doesn't come up for any throttle-related problems, that may be good news because the throttle motor assembly is almost 300 bucks, even at a discount auto parts store. Sometimes they clog up with carbon. They will not trip a code if they're dirty. They'll trip a code if they're broken down electronically. But if they're not broken down electronically, they won't trip a code most of the time. If it does nothing, I'm gonna go take it apart and clean it because he did mention that it often does it first thing in the morning. And if it's stuck with carbon and it's cold, then the carbon might stick early in the morning and then break itself loose. So let's go pull it off. Maybe it'll come on on the way home. Who knows? I kind of doubt it though. It's running too good. Here we go. We'll accelerate slow. It's not acting up. Well, accelerating fine. Didn't get stuck at 30. I have no acceleration problems. Now, truthfully, I'm surprised that this thing is running as smoothly as it is. Now, he is the original owner, but it actually runs quite well. Shifts fine. There's no lag when you either accelerate or decelerate. So, idle's fine. We'll shut it off. Now, it happened to him right before he got over here, he just told me. See, it was cold then. Rather than guess with a $300 part, we're gonna take a look at it, see if it needs cleaning. We'll take off the air duct between the air filter and the throttle assembly. There's one end. We'll get that out of the way. And then we do the other end. See this, he's unscrewed the bottom. Get this out of the way. Look at it, it's filthy. It's covered with carbon. Put carbon spray clean and spray the heck out of it. There we go, we'll spray it all clean. Now realize carbon can get hard. You might let it soak a little while. Then it'll break in and you can wipe it off better. Now you can see it's whistle clean. And here's a tip. If this was mechanically wearing out, there's plastic gears in here. When they wear out, you hear a grinding noise because the stupid plastic gears will grind. You step on the gas, you hear a grinding noise come in here. Have somebody step on the gas, listen. If you hear that grinding, it means the gears are shot and you need a new throttle assembly. In this case, it ran like a top for me. And since it did it, coming over here when it was cold, it could just be, it's dirty. Now, if he keeps having the same problem, he'll have to replace that. It's not that big of a deal. Four bolts, one, two, three, four. That's it, you unplug it, take the four bolts and bolt it on. But there's only one problem with that. Even at the discount auto parts stores, these things are like 290 bucks. <laughs> Do you want to throw it away for nothing? No, if you hear it grinding, you have to. But, always keep this in mind, didn't have any codes for the throttle assembly. And that's why I'm cleaning it. 
If you got codes for the throttle assembly and you clean it, you're practically pissing in the wind because the codes are there because it knows something either mechanically or electronically is wrong with the throttle. But if it's got carbon on it sticking, that won't trip any codes. It's the same thing with the fuel pump on an old car like this. Let's say your car dies and then it starts and it keeps dying and you got no codes at all. The first thing to check is the fuel pump because an old car like this, the computer doesn't have a sensor for fuel pressure, so it doesn't know what the fuel pressure is. So if the fuel pressure drops to zero, the computer doesn't know that. So if it did die on the road and never started again, and then later started, it could easily be the fuel pump's going out. It's kind of reverse analysis. You know what it isn't, because there's no codes. So if there are no codes, it's something the computer can't think of. In this case, it can't think that it's dirty. It only knows when something's broken, so this should fix it. So I'll put the intake hoses back on. Make sure they're nice and tight. You don't want any air leaks. And don't forget the bottom one. Pull on it. Make sure it's nice and tight. There's one thing. You had cleaner in there? It's going to start up like crap, because it's got to burn the cleaner out. That's normal. See how hard it is to start. Well, not too bad, actually. And it's not even really smoking. Just a tiny little bit. Now I've got it running with the AC. You'll get a little bit of shaking until it clears itself up. This should fix it. Now if it doesn't, it would be that that whole throttle assembly starting to break down. As you can see, it's easy to replace. So why spend 290 something bucks on something that a little spray cleaner might fix? Just remember, like I said, if you do have codes for the sensor itself, for the whole throttle body sensor and the throttle body motor, you're really better off on one of these buying the thing and putting it on and getting it out of the way because they will break down over time. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.